when I think of doom and post doom, I think of well, you know, nature, providence, uh, uh, Gaia, the world, the universe, reality uh, is passing judgment um, on what we've been doing this last couple of centuries. Um, in fact, that judgment is, is essentially been passed, and yeah. sentence is going to be carried out over the next several centuries. Um, and there's not a whole lot probably that we can do about it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of like you, you, we're, the, we're the condemned in the, in the dock and sentence has now been uh, cast upon us and we have to come to terms with what that means to us and how we're going to live with it or not live with it. One of the things I try to give witness to is, is how you can, and, and, and it's the reason for the title of my, my talk, um, how you actually can be happy. Uh, about the end of the world as we know it, um, because I've kind of been looking forward to it most of my adult life, and I hope I live to see it um, in that sense, right? Because the present system makes people miserable. Yes. And it's isolating and alienating and, and soul destroying. And why wouldn't we want that to go away once we understand what it is? Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that's a little weird for people because people tend to get very funereal about all of this, you know, doomsday. Let's all be sad and weep together. Um, but, you know, I, assuming that humanity uh, makes it through, um, there's a potential here for a far, far better world. Well, Sid, thank you for joining in on this uh, post-Doom conversation series. And thank I, you. I just learned about you, oh gosh, just in the last three or four months. Mm -hmm. uh, through your two videos that you delivered both sort of around Earth Day last year and then in 2019. And um, it just was really taken. And so uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, how come your two YouTube videos aren't more easily accessible from your own website? I was curious. You know, I didn't set out to, uh, uh, to be a voice, a public voice about these issues. They, they started out just as kind of internal Green Party um, you know, let's get together and talk about this. And the Greens at Virginia Tech, you know, there was an opportunity maybe to speak to a little wider audience, but, you know, we never had a ton of people there. Um, and uh, the, the talk I gave in 2018, I got, you know, when I put it up on YouTube, it got maybe 300 views. Um, but the talk I gave this past March kind of went viral a little bit, it's up to 40,000 views. And people are asking to talk to me, you know, and, and, uh, uh, that's not something I set out to do. So it's caught me a little bit flat footed. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to work out, you know, what's the best approach to all this now. <laughs> yeah, well, it is a, it is a bummer uh, when you'd prefer anonymity or at least sort of just behind the scenes. And then all of a sudden you're thrust into the public eye uh, because that's how I learned about mm -hmm. you, obviously. And um, before we get into the, the heart of this uh, podcast series, um, I would love for you to, because I'm imagining probably most of the people watching or listening to this won't have been familiar with your work. They haven't been students of yours or um, been involved in the Green Party um, in your part of the world. So help us get you, help us understand, you know, sort of a little bio. Give folks sure. who aren't familiar with you a, a sense of who you are. So uh, I... Uh professionally college math teacher. Um, that's what I've done for, for the last several decades. And uh, um, various other kinds of experience. I was in the army for a while and so on. Um, I have always taken an interest uh, in uh, sustainability issues and in culture and in sort of the, the arc of our trajectory um, as a civilization, uh, really from when I was pretty young. And uh, Putting all of that kind of together, I've been the last several years trying to figure out, you know, what is happening and uh, and what is going to happen because clearly things have entered a new phase. We're in a period of transition, very fast transition now, far faster than anybody can adapt to psychologically. And so I'm trying to keep up, I think, like everyone else is and, and bringing what education and insight I have to the task of trying to understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, you did so, I mean, uh, your your two presentations, I love the titles, Humanity, the final chapter, mm -hmm. was last year, and then this one, uh, or 2019, How to Enjoy the End of the World. Mm -hmm. But what I found so uh, refreshing was that somebody who's a 
mathematician and a, you know, involved in the Green Party, that you brought such a depth of ecological knowledge and ecological wisdom. I mean, my, my main mentors have been William Catton and his book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary mm -hmm. Change. And then I also interviewed as part of this series, Tom Wessel, uh, the Myth of Progress, and he's an ecologist, uh, which is, a, this is a fabulous little short introduction to the ecological worldview and why we are so unsustainable. But you, you right. brought uh, just a, an ease of how to communicate it and, um, you know, really great, compelling slides and all. And so I, I'm just curious, how has, you know, the language that I'm using for this series is post-doom. And that's it works for some, doesn't work for others. But I'm just curious, how does that language, you know, land with you? But but more importantly, how, what language do you find yourself using for yourself and others about these um, uh, rapidly contracting times? So doom is a, an interesting word. Uh, it's, it's old English. Uh, it, it means judgment. And uh, I got to thinking about that, you know, when, when you contacted me. Uh, and I was looking at your site and, and watching your videos. Um, and uh, so I looked up the old Domesday book, because uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting connection historically. William the Conqueror conquered uh, uh, the British Isles and then immediately sent out his minions to take stock of his new domain, right, of which he was now sovereign, so that he could tax it properly. And, and they put all those records in, in what was called the Domesday book which was kind of a funny thing to call it. And uh, a contemporary who worked on it at the time, this is up from Wikipedia, he said, for as the sentence of that strict and terrible last account cannot be evaded by any skillful, skillful subterfuge, so when this book is appealed to, its sentence cannot be quashed or set aside with impunity. Wow. That is why we have called the book the Book of Judgment, because its decisions, like those of the last judgment, are unalterable. And it immediately put me in mind of Wendell Berry's famous quote, you know, nature's a party to all our decisions and all our deals, and she has more votes and a longer memory and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Yeah, so w when I think of doom and post-doom, I think of, well, you know, nature, providence, uh, uh, Gaia, the world, the universe, reality, uh, is passing judgment um, on what we've been doing this last couple of centuries. Um, in fact, that judgment has is, is essentially been passed and yeah. sentence is going to be carried out over the next several centuries. Um, and there's not a whole lot probably that we can do about it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of like you, you, we're, the, we're the condemned in the, in the dock and sentence has now been uh, cast upon us and we have to come to terms with what that means to us and how we're going to live with it or not live with it. Wow, that's great. Oh, Sid, my gosh. Um, I will probably lift that uh, as, a, as a preview in this series because I, I fully agree with that and that metaphor is, is powerful. And so much of my own message I find is um, in the vein of, okay, given that, is there anything that we can do or stop doing that would be redemptive within the body of life? that would uh, not to save us from extinction, if that's in the cards, which it may be, um, certainly not to save industrialism from collapse, which is of course inevitable. The extinction of Homo Colossus is absolutely inevitable and necessary, but to in some senses uh, redeem, repair, uh, sort of that whole metanoia, the, the repentance conversion. Is there any is there anything that we can do as a species and as religious leaders in religious communities, because that's mostly who I speak to, um, that, would, that would be perceived by life, Gaia, reality, the universe, God, that would be experienced as redemptive? And so that's sort of an inquiry that I'm in throughout uh, 2020. Well, I'm thinking now about what you, what you just uh, were, were speaking about. Um, and, you know, we... we we tend to think and act in terms of, you know, what we may do ourselves as individuals. Um, and when it comes to the species as a whole, um, I'm not quite sure how to unpack what we should do um, because we're, we don't have that much agency as a species. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I have agency as an individual, but as a species, we're pretty much, and, and, and this of course is, is 
part of the problem we have is we tend not to recognize this. Um, we're just part of the unfolding uh, tree of life. And, you know, we're not the first species to go into overshoot. We won't be the last. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we live with the consequences and we may or may not survive as a species or evolve into a new one. Um, but I, I don't have any control over that. And I don't think anyone does. Um, there are some things we can control collectively, but they tend to be small and local things. Um, so, you know, less hubris, um, a greater realization that we're of the earth, not on it. Yes. Um, and, and aside from that, you know, I think, uh, trying to be as human as we can be, I think being a human is a good thing to do. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's about humility. If there is anything redemptive, and again, if there is any agency larger than, you know, small groups, I think it would be stepping more into what has been, evidence suggests, the only sustainable stance toward primary reality, which is something along the lines of, we belong to the land, not the land belongs mm -hmm. to us. One of the things that I think is important to understand, and this is the, the mathematician in me coming out, um, Civilization is, uh, uh, is an emergent property. Um, it's not something that we deliberately set about building. Uh, we, we'd like to take credit for it, you know, and, and we do take credit for it, but, but civilization is something that emerges from the interactions of uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And that's not something you can script. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I even have a little bit of difficulty using the word civilization in the singular as if it's one thing. Uh, I found very helpful, for example, um, February 19th, 2019, uh, BBC had an article by Luke Kemp called Are We on the Road to Civilizational Collapse? And he has a chart that lists 88 civilizations from 3000, mm. I think 3000 BCE until 1000 of the common era, that 4000 year period, and shows 88 civilizations mm -hmm. and, and how long they lasted and what they died from and that sort They're of thing. They're all gone, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's right. so, you know, I draw a distinction between pro future cultures, pro future societies, mm -hmm. those that can live in place without destroying the place, and anti future cultures or anti future civilizations that tend to exploit the living mm -hmm. world and ultimately cause their own right. demise. Right. Well, Sid, I'm, I'm curious, the heart of this series is really inviting various thought leaders, teachers, artists, um, activists to share their story, their, their pilgrimage, their journey. Like, how, did, how was it for you growing up? When did you begin to gain an ecological understanding? When did you begin to understand Overshoot, for example? When did you begin to understand climate and the, the sort of uh, the, the mess, the predicament that we're in now? So share, take as much time as you want, but share a little bit about how, what it was like for you growing up, how that shifted, because it's this sort of testimonial, to use religious language, but this sort of story sharing that many people who are just coming to this, who are just moving through denial or functional denial, um, and are in that, oh God, or ugh, or we're fucked or whatever place they get to. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. the various thought leaders and, and guests in the series sharing their stories that can be of particular use. So share, share your story with us, if you would. Well, I was quite fortunate uh, as a kid because uh, I had, particularly on my father's side, uh, family members who already kind of got a lot of, uh, of this, um, and who exposed me to uh, a great appreciation of nature uh, and of uh, natural beauty. So my grandfather, uh, my father's parents were both artists, um, and uh, some of you can see paintings behind me that uh, are, are from those days. Um, and uh, my father, or my grandfather, uh, painted landscapes um, and used to take me birding and take me out sketching. And so, you know, I'm an eight or 10 or 12 year old kid and I'm being taken out to such and so state park all day so that we can watch birds and he can sketch landscapes, um, which at the time was a dead boar. Uh, and I'm sure I was a terrible nuisance to him, but which uh, later in life, of course, became, uh, in, you know, that was really important seed material in terms of experiences. Um, and you know, when I see things now, because he so loved birds, and we just had this recent report on the, the decline of North American birds, you know, and he would have been heartbroken. Yeah. 
absolutely heartbroken. Um, and so that's that kind of awareness I, I was fortunate enough to have from before I was aware of it, um, aware of that awareness, if you will. Um, and my father uh, was pretty counterculture. Um, you know, I was growing up in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, and already by the time I was an adolescent, I was reading The Nation because he was sticking it in my hands and I was reading Camus and I was reading Sartre. And, you know, he was, he was definitely uh, wanting to cultivate in me some skepticism about the goodness of, of modern industrial society. And it worked, um, you know, so I was a skeptic of all that from the very beginning. And when I, as everyone did in those days, when I read The Lord of the Rings and, and got interested in Tolkien uh, and then read his biography and came to understand that a lot of what motivated him was a realization that the world was being destroyed, um, the world as he knew it. And that, you know, that was a hundred years ago. Um, so those were things that fortunately I didn't have to uh, stumble upon in adult life, I already knew. Yeah. And then the question for me, you know, it came to be how do I understand this and how do I analyze this and how do I live in and with this? Um, and so that's, that's where I am now. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, how do you, um, I've not asked this, uh, I don't think of anybody else, but I, I want to ask this of you. Because the, the myth of perpetual progress is, is, the, is really the secular religion of the Western world, really the mm -hmm. industrial world, mm -hmm. how do you counter that? Like when you talk to somebody or somebody who, who may go to the place of, well, you know, they'll think of something or technology will fix it or human ingenuity in the market and technology will, you know, somebody who's still very much in that uh, secular religion of perpetual progress. How do, how do, you, how do you speak to them? You're right that it is a faith, and that's uh, critically important. And I always think of what Chesterton uh, wrote about that. He said, you should always treat the other man's faith gently because it might be all he has to believe with. Um, and so I think it's very important to, to take people seriously. Um, and then uh, it's, I think there are two things. First of all, there, there's a world of facts, and, and that's harder and harder for a lot of people to access. It's part of the pathology of our time. But to the extent that a person is open to facts, um, that's a good place to go. And, and, you know, a study of history, a study of, of how the world actually works and how it has worked out for most people, uh, as opposed to just mm -hmm. we privileged few. Um, but then also, why, why is it that the person is fixated on that? Why, why is what John Michael Greer calls the mono future, uh, so critically important to people that they'll, they'll go into a panic if you, if you challenge it. Um, and if you can get someone to focus on their feelings about it and why it is they're attached to it, I think that too provides an opportunity then to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, because people don't realize they can be happy. Um, in fact, that people have generally been happier uh, than they are now. Um, without industrial civilization. And, and that knowledge is something that people need to now start being exposed to as much as possible. Yeah, boy, do I agree. I've, I've read over the last six or seven years, um, I think I've read 14, maybe 15 of John Michael Greer's books. And those that really lift up how a retro future, uh, a, a future of less energy consumption, uh, less material consumption, mm -hmm. um, less waste can actually be an mm -hmm. improved future, um, far richer in actual life mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I found mm -hmm. that John Michael Greer is just a gifted uh, writer and thinker along those lines and critiquer of progress, the, the myth of progress. So one of the things I try to give witness to is, is how you can, and, and, and it's the reason for the title of my, my talk, um, how you actually can be happy uh, about the end of the world as we know it. Um, because I've kind of been looking forward to it most of my adult life, and I hope I live to see it um, in that sense, right? Because the present system makes people miserable. Yes. And it's isolating and alienating and, and soul destroying. And why wouldn't we want that to go away once we understand what it is? Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that's a little weird for people because people tend to get very funereal about all of this, you know, doomsday, let's all be sad and weep together. Um, but, you know, I, assuming that humanity uh, makes it through, um, there's a potential here for a far, far better world. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm becoming um, less convinced that uh, in an abrupt climate change regime that um, there'll be a whole lot of humans to have that future experience if, if there are any of us. But I am more convinced than ever that um, the kind of relationship, the exploitive uh, rapacious relationship that industrialism has had with everything we depend upon is so soul killing uh, to use religious language. I mean, I, I, the first person that I read that gave me a light into this uh, in a different way was um, Dave Pollard. I, I read quite a few of Dave Pollard's blogs. He had one where he identified, based on the scholarship of others, what he, what he saw was uh, eight human universals that are universal needs in every culture throughout all time. And it's amazing, uh, I've used those in several uh, uh, of my presentations online, and it's amazing how deeply they resonate with audiences of every kind, but also how, com how obvious it is that industrial civilization doesn't meet most, if not all, of those eight needs, and how most, if not all, of them were met in spades in tribal cultures, uh, indigenous cultures, um, what I call pro-future cultures. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, anything else that you want to say about your story before I ask about the uh, sort of human nature? I like to ask questions related to the big picture, cosmology, universe story, whatever. Uh, human nature, sort of how we are wired evolutionarily, our instincts and mm -hmm. how mismatched they are mm -hmm. to present day conditions. And then impermanence and death. And so before we get to those, right. anything else you want to share in terms of your own journey? Was there any, even though you had this understanding for years, was there a time when it sort of hit you with a certain depth of sobriety or depth of like, oh my gosh, or wow, this is really real? Or have you been sort of in acceptance yes. mode or beyond acceptance mode for so long you can't hardly remember that? Well, it's not so much that I've been in acceptance mode. Um, uh, I've there was a, a time, and it was fairly recently, actually, uh, uh, maybe 15 years ago, um, when it, I really did get hit hard. Um, I had pursued an academic career after I got out of the Army um, because I, uh, like academics, I like studying. I fell in love with mathematics rather unexpectedly. Um, but... Uh, I really like academic life, and I was fortunate enough uh, between my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree to spend a year at Cambridge University doing what's called the Math Tripos Part Three, which is a one-year postgraduate. They sort of invite everybody to come and see if there's anybody good enough to stay. Um, and uh, but it exposed me to that ancient, now ancient, uh, you know, medieval uh, culture of the academic system. And then I came back to the United States to start an academic career and discovered, as all the academics of my generation have, that the profession has now been taken over by the system and commodified um, to the point where faculty are no longer uh, in charge of academia. Uh, they no longer call the shots. Um, we've had this explosion of administration. And at the same time, students' uh, lives as students have been destroyed by a rapacious uh, financial system that views them as a source of income. And so we have this one and a half trillion dollar explosion of student loan debt. And so I found myself in the middle early in my career of this thing um, that I had longed to be a part of and to contribute to and to live my life in and found that what, by the time I got there, it had been turned into something horrifying. Yeah. Um, that I could no longer love. Uh, I still love my students and I still love my subject, but, but the world of academia in the United States has been corrupted along with everything else. Um, and there's no saving it at this point. Yeah. Um, so that really did hit me very, very hard because that was my, that was my professional life. That was what everything I had, had worked for. And I realized that it was no longer there and it wasn't going to be there. And there was nothing I could do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was tough. That was yeah. very tough. And it, it, it very much brought home to me, okay, we're all going to have to live with um, the fact that the civilization that gave birth to us is one that we've turned and uh, destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and now we have to live without it. Yeah. 
Wow. Well put. I'm curious, what, what have been some of the tools or practices or exercises or mentors? Like who has supported you? What have you found nourishing to your own life, your own soul, your own thinking um, in the course of this whole process? Well, so many things. Early in life, family and books, you know, kind of the high order term. And then uh, as a young adult, uh, I studied yoga. I fell in with uh, a fellow and his family who um, had a lot of yogic and spiritual practices. And that really assisted me in coming to terms with some instability in my own life. Um, and uh, at, around that same time, um, I uh, converted to Catholicism. And that's something that um, has lasted and grown throughout my life um, and is now a very important part of it. Um, I think that uh, mature spiritual traditions are uh, something that humans have always relied upon as an essential foundation in their lives. And, and one of the things that we've robbed people of is much of that opportunity by trivializing or commodifying um, spirituality as well. Yes. Uh, so that's been, that's been huge for me. Um, my, you know, my loving wife and family and friends and community. Uh, yeah. It's other people tell us who we are. And, yes. Uh, yeah. that's, that's what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I, I, I regularly am reminded of the love of my wife and family and how that not only sustains me, but allows me to wake up most days really excited to contribute whatever I can and to make whatever difference mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. at whatever scale that I can uh, within the context of a declining, degrading, you know, collapsing uh, uh, social and civilizational structures. I've been doing a lot of thinking lately because I, I too am grounded in, in the Christian tradition. I call myself a Christian naturalist. Mm -hmm. I was raised Catholic, uh, but ended up becoming mm -hmm. a Protestant minister. And I'm very interested in how the Christian mythic language can be interpreted uh, in ways that are ecologically wise and genuinely prophetic in the best sense of that, like speaking on behalf of reality. One of the great gifts that uh, Pope Francis has given us is Laudato Si. I completely um, the agree. encyclical on care of our common home. And I think he's really, he's really moved the whole church to an awareness of that need. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm in a small way in my own parish working to, to try to help people become more conscious about. Um, it's, it's something that we're going to need as the collapse unfolds because the stresses are going to start to build and people are going to need answers and, and how do I think about this? Um, yes. And uh, those who are within the Christian faith tradition, I think, yeah, we definitely need to make sure that uh, we speak that language. Yes, exactly. Well, Sid, I'm, I'm curious, um, given the depth of your understanding of the ecological predicament uh, and your groundedness in the, uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition, um, how do you understand sort of the big picture, the, the universe story as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story? In my language, what God, reality, I use the word God and reality interchangeably, what God has revealed, what reality has revealed through evidence uh, about physical evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution. How has that story informed you or, or uh, in some way uh, made a difference in your life or has it? It has. Um, I think uh, it, it's very hard to get a good, clear, unbiased uh, grounding in the, the physical story of the universe itself and of life because it's very, we don't have many metaphors for it, right? The, the orders of magnitude are outside of our experience, uh, particularly with the time dimension. Um, that's the hardest thing, I think, for people. Um, you know, how do you deal with expanses of time that are simply out, completely outside of our capacity to imagine experience it? Um, and also, of course, uh, the story of evolution is one that we've really had. I mean, it's, it's kind of like back in the day when they taught chemistry and they used tinker toys, right, and stuck balls on sticks, and this is what an atom looks like. And no, it's not at all what an atom looks like or how it works. And, this, and, and, our, and our thoughts about evolution are, are on about that same arc, right? It started off with a kind of a stick figure, um, almost embarrassingly naive and simplistic notion of how evolution worked. And, and now we're up to uh, a very subtle and profound uh, 
notion of how evolution unfolds. And it's nothing like what they told us when we were kids. Yeah, exactly. um, so gaining, an, uh, gaining a real understanding of that as opposed to a, an old storybook understanding of that is hard to do. Um, but I think it's a worthwhile thing to pursue. And there's a lot of good media, popular media and, 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 and uh, you know, PBS and things that are helping people do that. Um, but how you relate it then back to how our civilization fits into it all, that's a, that's a tough one. That's very difficult. Um, and, and of course, it starts to, to bump up against eschatology, right? Our own narrative, our own mythos about endings and beginnings and how we fit into the world. Uh, and one of the things that's greatly challenging, I think, for people in our time is somehow integrating all of that. How do you do it? Yeah. That's really tough. Um, and, uh, you know, I, people say I could never be a Christian. And I say, I don't blame you um, because <laughs> it's really challenging. <laughs> to somehow integrate, you know, all those different aspects of yeah. our narrative world. Um, it, it's a fun challenge, but it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there you are. Well, Sid, how do you understand human nature? I mean, from this perspective that we're talking about, I, I just want to invite you to share anything that you'd like to around sort of human nature and your take on that and how that either uh, assists or m makes things more challenging in a current context? Well, I, you know, I, I kind of hold two seemingly contradictory thoughts at the same time. Um, and I'm kind of struggling with resolving the contradiction. On the one hand, I think human nature is fairly immutable. Uh, I think if you, um, if you take someone uh, out of the 12th century or, or, or the 12th century BC um, and got to know them, you'd find that they're, you know, they're just folks. Um, nothing, nothing uh, essentially different about them at all. Um, that's on the, on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, um, we evolve socially and we evolve intellectually. And, uh, and so we pass on, you know, I'm no fan of Dawkins, but he really nailed it with the term memes, right? We do pass on not just uh, genetic information, but memetic information. Um, and that has a vast influence on on uh, not only how we live individually, but on, on the emergent culture uh, that, that comes about as a consequence of it. So I don't think you can change people, but you can certainly give them new information and new experiences, and you can help them unpack the experiences they've already got in new ways. Um, and we, we do that for ourselves all the time. Um, that's, that's the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of personal growth and maturity. Um, as far as how human nature relates to where we are now, um, you know, the, uh, the trains left the station on where we are now. Nothing, nothing we're going to do uh, is going to prevent um, the collapse of industrial civilization and a correction of our ecological overshoot. Um, one way or another, that's going to occur. Um, but I think what we can do is we can, so we talked about religion before. Here's a very important thing to me. Um, I don't give a tremendous amount of weight to time as such, because although we do live uh, temporally, I think that's mostly in our head. Um, I, you know, part of my uh, religious training in eschatology has helped me think in terms of eternity as much as in, in terms of present, past, and future, and uh, all time being eternally present. And so rather than be focused on what are we going to do so that 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, I think we can focus on the present as, as part of that tapestry and situate ourselves in it and make of it the best present that it can be. And that is connected to the past and to the future. You know, I don't think of the past as fixed and the future as undetermined. I think of it all as being part of an unfolding pattern. Um, and, uh, and so where does human nature fit into that? Well, um, where it always has fit into it. Um, whether you take a, uh, a Judeo-Christian mythos and talk about being fallen and redeemed, or you take a, a more of a Buddhist approach and you talk about, you know, uh, release from desire and, and enlightenment, um, whatever your, whatever your story is, 
um, that's the story you're living right now. Um, and uh, your human nature is complex and multifarious. It's animal, it's spiritual, but it's not constrained to whatever your conscious mind wants to make the world out to be at this moment. So don't fall into that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, that was a pretty rambling answer, but I don't know what else to give you. Well, no, no, it's actually uh, along the lines of what, I, what I'm thinking myself. I mean, I'm reminded, I did a series of programs recently with um, the systems ecologist, Joe Brewer, uh, uh, up in uh, northern uh, Bellingham, Washington. We did some programs together where we sort of just riffed in and out of each other. And one of the things he mentioned mm -hmm. was that in Ed Wilson, uh, one of his Pulitzer Prize winning books, I think it was On Being Human, where he talked about, you know, we so often think of baboons as having a nature. Well, baboons have a nature that's very mm -hmm. different when they're experiencing population pressure and when they're not. And sure. humans, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Humans in sustainable pro-future cultures where those, those uh, eight human universals that I mentioned before about Dave, that Dave Pollard wrote about um, are being met mm -hmm. is a very different human nature than human nature in self-destructive, unsustainable cultures. It's, it's almost like in the same way that a caged animal is not the same as an animal in its, in its wild habitat. And I think uh, I agree with you that, you know, if you could go back and converse with anybody 1,200 years ago or 2,400 years ago or 3,600 years ago, they would be sort of just common folk. But if you go back 10,000, 12,000 years in healthy cultures where they're born that way, raised that way, and die in that, I, my hunch is that there would be a level of ease. It's, it's interesting. I just recently read a book um, called Civilized to Death, The Price of Progress. Mm -hmm. um, and in there, he talked about even, the, even our understanding of the noble savage, that phrase was originally meant when it was first articulated was that the only people who had the freedoms and the ease of life as we find in savage cultures were the nobles in England. It wasn't the common person. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, e even the language gets mm -hmm. distorted. That's a nice point. Yes. The, the other question that I often ask uh, guests in the series is related to impermanence and death. Um, I have what Connie and I call a sacred science or a, a, a meaningful, inspiring, evidential understanding of mortality, impermanence, and death. In fact, for many years, we did programs on that. Connie wrote a children's story uh, related to that. Um, but I'm curious how you hold impermanence and death, how your faith informs that, how your science informs that, and whether that understanding um, makes a difference for you in this current context. Um, I don't really think in terms of the death of the species much. Um, I recognize that it's an inevitability. Uh, and as I've heard you say over and over, it could be 10 years or 10,000 or 10 million. No way of knowing that. Um, although things are looking a little grim right at the moment. Um, but not for the first time. You know, there have been bottlenecks before, so who knows? We, we may or may not be facing that end. But I don't tend to think in terms of that very much, partly because I don't have any way to unpack that um, for myself. Uh, you know, I have a son, I hope he will have children. Uh, in fact, he's the only son of an only son of an only son. So I kind of really hope, um, you know, that that, that that might continue um, because I think that's just part of living a full life. And I think people should live full lives. I don't, one of the things I hear from people now is, is this, this shrinking back of, well, the world's coming to an end, so I can't have kids, I can't live my dreams, I can't do this, I can't do that. Um, that's part of, that's part of boxing yourself in with a story that you, you shouldn't indulge in. Um, you should, you should, it's never been that great, you know, honestly, for human beings. It's usually been a matter of famine or volcanoes or disease or something. You should live a full life um, and, and let the species take care of itself. Um, you know, our work is before us, it's present, it's here, and we can start doing it right now. Uh, and we can start living a full life right now. And uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about and be informed about and be concerned about what's going on. But when it comes to what's in here, um, I think we want to be full. You know, let, let your chest expand. Um, and, and, and life is a meal, take big bites. Um, and you're gonna die. That's not news, you know. I, I, I've often fantasized about you know, because I, I'm accused of being a bit doom and gloom at times. So I fantasize about getting up on a stage and looking at everybody very fiercely and saying, you're all going to die. 
and uh, and then just say, but you already knew that, right? Because <laughs> that's not news. Exactly. Um, life, life and death are are two parts of the same thing. You can't have one without the other. It wouldn't even make any sense um, to try to have one without the other, despite you know the fantasies of certain rich people. Uh, so live now. Yeah. Right? Live right now because your end is in your beginning. As a Christian, you know, the cradle is never far from the cross. Um, it all works together and you can't, you know, embrace it. Embrace it fully. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I just learned two months ago that my youngest daughter is pregnant and she'll be, mm -hmm. she's due in May. And mm -hmm. prior to her announcing that, I actually had a lot of fear about, because she had mentioned she was thinking about getting pregnant. She's 29 right. years old. Right. And then I really had a metanoia. I had a conversion uh, last summer in, uh, I think, early September or maybe late August, where I just felt this peace, this, this acceptance and full celebration, actually, mm -hmm. if that was mm -hmm. her choice. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And now I'm, I, I've remained in that place. I'm excited. Yes, uh, my grandchild, we don't know whether it's going to be a boy or girl, but my grandchild, I also, I also have a nine-year-old granddaughter, mm -hmm. but uh, my grandchildren could very well die prematurely or earlier right. and have a difficult time. And yet um, to be, you know, I would not want, if worst case scenario, this is one of the last generations to have the experience of motherhood, I surely would not want to deprive my daughter of that mother-child bond. Yeah. And um, and me being and engaged uh, as a as a as a grandpa, you know, yeah. in whatever ways that I can. I you know, if, if I had one thing to say to people, and I, I've said this a lot to people since my last talk, because you know it did create a lot of anxiety in a lot of folks. And the one thing I want to say to people is is don't shrink back from life. Yes. Don't let anything cause you to shrink back from life. Now, having said that, um, you can be practical. Yeah. Right, and as a practical matter, we should be preparing for the worst in our own lives and as communities. Yes. But that's something else again, right? Yes. That's that's um, that's a different set of issues. It yeah. shouldn't be about what what can my life be about. Yeah, that shouldn't be something that takes that away from you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Sid, the last two questions that I'd love to invite you to address are um, related to sort of remaining opportunities. Like, what do you see as still possible and what do you genuinely believe is no longer possible? One of the things to organize thinking is to think about boundary conditions. Um, you know, what is, what, what is the boundary of this, you know, area of discussion, this topic? And so I thought, well, let's, let's have a scale from minus five to five, where five is, you know, things we can definitely keep. And, and minus five is things we are definitely going to lose. And, and zero can be, you know, a coin toss, who knows. Um, and I thought, okay, so things we will definitely keep. That's a short list. Um, I don't know of anything that I'm 100% confident is going to be here in 100 years. Um, the earth will still be going around the sun, probably. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's very close to a five, uh, but not much else is. Um, and, and, and again, that's nothing new in human experience. That's been a constant in human experience for as long as we've been conscious. Um, at the other end, minus five, that's a little longer list. Um, things we will definitely lose. Um, Star Trek, out the window. Um, there's going to be no Star Trek world. Um, there, we're not going to be using uh, the kind of energy on a per capita basis that, that we've grown used to. And the natural world is going to take a long, long time to recover from what we've done to it. And by long, long time, there again, you know, humans can't imaginatively encompass the kind of time frame we're talking about. So it's, from our point of view, it's kind of permanent. Um, you know, give the planet 10 million years and it'll be lush and green and, and full of diverse life. But that's not meaningful to us, right, except right. in the abstract. Right, exactly. Um, and so in between... One of the things I think is most important to communicate is that anybody who thinks they're certain about what we're going to keep and what we're going to lose probably hasn't thought about it carefully enough because there aren't enough certainties to latch on to. Mm -hmm. um, whether we're talking about the climate and how it's going to unfold, you know, we know it's going to change and change radically, but exactly how? Nobody can possibly know that. Um, how human society is going to respond uh, in the face of, you know, the biggest crisis that, that the planet has ever seen. We can speculate 
Um, we can certainly look for historical analogs. We can worry about various possibilities, but nobody can say, here's what's going to happen. Here's what we're going right. to keep. Here's what we're going to lose. So, you know, will my grandkids be able to use a computer? I don't know. Yeah. Um, there are good reasons to think not, but there are equally good reasons to think that, you know, maybe that's a solvable problem on a, on a, on a different kind of uh, civilizational basis. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that. And I, and I can't imagine that anyone knows the answer to that. So um, having played that game with myself now, um, it brings me back to um, whatever is going to emerge from all this is going to emerge from what we do right now in our own lives and how we, uh, how we uh, approach the problems that, and the predicaments that we're in. Yeah. Well, wow, that was great. I mean, you know, yeah, it comes back to how then shall we live? Mm -hmm. on a day-by-day mm -hmm. -day basis right. uh, in, in light of those uncertainties, in light of the fact that we are, you know, there are certain mm -hmm. things that are factual. We're in the contracting decades or century or, uh, or two of uh, this form of empire, this form of civilization. Um, and yet the uncertainties are such that uh, we don't know what will emerge, what chaos catalyzes creativity that we couldn't have foreseen and that sort of thing. Um, you know, from the fall of Rome to, to the high middle ages, that was 700 years. Yes. Um, it takes a long time. So, you know, as I said at the end of my talk, you know, we're, we're starting, we're going to start writing a new story and, and then other people are going to finish it because that's how it works. The, the whole wild card is how, how rapidly things unfold with the Arctic having less and less sea ice and more and more methane release. That's, that's the one thing that could accelerate things so fast, um, or it's one of the things that could accelerate things so fast. As, as North Americans, I think there are things that uh, we should be more thoughtful about. Um, you know, it's, everyone knows the statistic, it, it, Americans use, you know, two to three to seven times as much of the planet on a per capita basis as other people. But there's a historical reason for that. Um, it, it, it's because, um, you know, uh, it turned out that, that we had the disease against which the indigenous people had no immunity. If it had been the other way around, um, that would have been very different. And so we got this free continent. Yeah. Uh, and then we turned around and used the disintegration of the old order in Europe uh, to impose economic hegemony through Bretton Woods and, and uh, federal dollar hegemony. And so um, that allowed us to print money without consequences. And the result is that Americans have gotten used to being very rich. And that's going away. Yes. And when that goes away, and then, well, I should say when, as it goes away, because it began about 30 years ago and it's picking up speed now. Yep. yep. Um, here in North America, we're facing social stresses and psychological stresses that I don't know of any historical precedent. Yeah. I mean, a little bit Weimar Germany, but not really. Yeah. Um, and so that I think as we think about our communities and our relationships and our political and institutional life, that's something very close to home and very urgent and very present that's unfolding in this moment that I think is far more useful for us to be coming to terms with. Um, than what's happening in the Arctic, because what am I going to do about the Arctic, yeah. right? Right. right? But I can certainly go down to the city council or the, or the county supervisors and, uh, and try to help my community be resilient and adapt to what's going to be a very rough ride. Yes, yes, exactly. Wow. Well, Sid, the one question I'd like to invite you to conclude with, and you've already touched on this in several ways, uh, is... Um, what gifts have you found, gift or gifts, have you found on the other side of accepting our predicament? Um, how do you wake up each day just inspired to do what you can do, where you can do it, at the scale that you can do it? Yeah. Well, as you say, I've, I've touched on uh, that I think um, what we're saying goodbye to, uh, we'll be happy to see the back of in many ways. It's like good riddance to that, you know, the car culture, uh, especially commercial culture. Um, I mean, the worst thing to happen to humanity, I think, ever was the commodification of culture. Um, because, because culture is what tells us who we are. It's, it's how we tell our story to one another. It's how we, it's how we become and, and how we express humanity. David Fleming wrote, community is the habitat of culture. 
Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, that got taken away uh, about a hundred years ago. Is when it really got going. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a fantastic. Everyone should watch this. A fantastic documentary by Adam Curtis called "The Century of the Self." Yes, I was just going to say that. I'm so and glad it, you did. It, it unfolds that whole story, and you and you look back now over a hundred years, and you say. No wonder we're fucking nuts. Yes, exactly. No wonder that as socially we're, we're insane, we're certifiable. And the reason is because that which makes us human uh, was, was taken from us and then is sold back to us in a package processed form that we can't use. Yes, exactly. Right? Um, so uh, when I look to uh, future, uh, close to collapse future, uh, and by collapse, you know, that covers a lot of territory. Yeah. I'm thinking here of the collapse of, of industrial civilization, not Western civilization as such, but industrial civilization. Yes, exactly. That's that's in the minus five part, right? That's yes, going exactly. away right. exactly. uh, as a simple matter of physics. And it's not, not, you know, no matter what anybody does. Um, as I look past that, um, I see the opportunity for us to reclaim our humanity in ways that we haven't had for a long time. And fortunately, all the raw material is still there. Yeah. And there are a lot of fantastic, creative, wonderful people who are producing culture within their communities. And that's something that can just be suddenly flourish, right? It could be a, it could be a kind of a renaissance, really. Um, and that, that makes my heart swell. You know, I'm, I'm ready to have that. And I'm sad that I'm too old, uh, probably to see most of it. You know, I'm uh, here, people say, I feel sorry for young people. Well, I'm a little bit envious, too. Uh, I mean, I feel sorry for the hardship they're going to endure, but I'm a little bit envious that they get to see a world which is going to be, you know, potentially um, really great uh, in, in important ways. So, yeah. Well, well, Sid, thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, a pure delight for me, and I look forward to more interactions with you, uh, not just on the theological stuff, but on everything we've been talking about here. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for this opportunity. I've had a good time. It's been fun.